Hello and welcome to Nothing But The Truth. You can't have failed to notice how Sanjay Baru's biography of Dr. Manmohan Singh, the accidental Prime Minister, has created a storm of controversy. It's all over the newspaper front pages. It dominates television news. Now with me to talk about the book, as well as the criticism he faces, is the author himself, Sanjay Baru. Sanjay Baru, let's start with some of the searingly honest comments you make about Dr. Manmohan Singh. You write, many believe that in not asserting the authority inherent in his office, he devalued it, his willingness to be pushed around by his party and coalition partners, and to have his decisions publicly challenged by Rahul Gandhi irretrievably damaged his image. The impression that creates in my mind is of a good but weak man. I think that's a fair impression. I mean, he was certainly a good man. And I've said in the book uh, that he was also a good prime minister in the sense that he was an effective leader of policy, uh, both domestic policy and foreign policy. I think where he failed, and I've, that is the criticism I have in the book, is in being a political leader. And I've said it repeatedly that the prime minister in this country is not just head of government. He is, in fact, head of the country. He is the, he's the personification of the sovereignty of this country. And that's where Dr. Manmohan Singh failed. He did fail there. And that's where his weakness showed. Absolutely. Now, in fact, in your book, you quote a conversation you had with him where he says, there cannot be two centers of power. I have to accept that the party president, that's Sonia Gandhi, is the center of power. He readily accepted that he was subordinate to her and treated himself as junior to her. Yes, and this was justified in the, in the initial period. I remember Sitaram Yachuri actually saying to me, but you know, this is how the Communist Party is organized. In Bengal, Jyoti Basu was answerable to Pramod Das Gupta. And this is how Murli Manohar Joshi, oh, sorry, Manohar Joshi and Bal Thakre functioned. So what is new? And I would say to him, sorry, chief minister is different. The prime minister of the country is a prime minister of the country. And therefore, it cannot be subordinate to the party president. In fact, this issue came up at the very beginning, and I've recorded it in the book, when Acharya Kripalani, as president of the Congress party, demanded from Nehru access to what government was doing. And, and was refused. Was refused. Nehru told him, become a minister, then I'll tell you what we are up to in government. And thereafter, party presidents were appointed by Nehru and served at Nehru's behest and wishes. Yeah, and then Nindira Gandhi made herself the party president and that tradition continued. Dr. Manmohan Singh unfortunately reversed that relationship. The party president became the supreme person. Yeah. He became subordinate. In a sense, that's not what the constitution intends. The constitution intends the prime minister to be numero uno. Absolutely. The prime minister is the head of the government. He's the leader of the treasury benches in parliament. And he represents the country internationally. In agreeing to see himself as subordinate and therefore agreeing to distort what the constitution intends of the role of the prime minister did he have any regrets i mean did he do this with regret or was he simply accepting a reality because the prime ministership in a sense was gifted to him by mrs gandhi and so he knew he hadn't earned it it was a gift she has to therefore be number one well it's interesting in the beginning he was not very comfortable with this role uh, he chafed Yes, he Jeff, and I, I give one example, but you know I, I know of other examples where he was not too comfortable with uh, being you know answerable. But I think over time, and particularly in UPA two, he just was resigned to this reality. There is an instance in your book where, in fact, one of his officials said to him, "Do you think we need to clear this with Sonia Gandhi or whatever?" And his answer is, "I am the prime minister." Absolutely, absolutely. But unfortunately, having said it, he didn't act a lot of the time as if he was the Prime Minister. Well, he did act a lot of the times in UPA 1, which, uh, which is the point I make. But, but not UPA 2. Not towards the, yeah, not in UPA 2. Now, in your book, there's a small paragraph on page 36 where you write about Pulak Chatterjee. You mm -hmm. say he was inducted into the PMO at Sonia Gandhi's behest. He had daily meetings with her. And then, very carefully you've written, he was said to brief her on key issues of the day and sought her instructions on important files to be cleared by the PM. It sounds as if she sort of used him as a remote control to direct the Prime Minister in whichever direction she wished him to go. I think so. I think there's been a wrong interpretation of this part in the, in the media where people seem to think that I suggest he used to actually carry files to her, etc., which would contravene uh, official secret secrets. You don't need to carry files exactly. to consult I think someone. There was a briefing on issues and, and uh, this was not a secret uh, that he would actually meet her and take her views on issues before. And those views would condition quite often 
the decisions the Prime Minister made yeah. on important subjects. Indeed. And he was therefore the conduit she used mm -hmm. to, how shall I put it in quotations, influence him. That's right. And then there was a formal institution of the National Advisory Council. And Pulok would often attend those meetings. Now, of course, there were instances when Sonia's influence or Sonia's uh, supremacy actually undermined him. You recount in your book how in 2009, just after it was widely believed that he'd won the election for Congress, she offered the finance ministership to Pranab Mukherjee without even informing or consulting the Prime Minister. He wanted to see Rangarajan, but he simply had to accept what Sonia had done and Rangarajan never got the job. Yes, that is the, my understanding of what happened. I mean, I know for a fact that Rangarajan was sought to be inducted when Chidambaram was moved from finance ministry to home ministry, which was in UPA 1. But uh, I think uh, Mr. Mukherjee then became finance minister in UPA 2. Uh, and at that point, I don't think that was the Prime Minister's first choice. So once again, on a critical question of who will be his finance minister, which many think is the, most, is the second most important job, he was undermined by her. Yes. And in fact, your book says that this deflation of authority, you use that phrase, was something he never recovered from. In your eyes, is it responsible for the fact that in UPA 2, he was a very different Prime Minister, almost listless and spiritless, compared to what he'd been in UPA 1? Absolutely, Karan. I mean, for me, the moment of truth was when on 2nd June 2009, he actually said to me, that he was willing to sacrifice, he, he had been willing to sacrifice his life for the victory. You know, he had a major heart operation in February 2009 and he had campaigned through the summer months of April, May. And when I said to him that, you know, you, you really went out of your way, he said, I risked my life for the victory. And to me, it appeared that he, he believed that the victory was his. And I do actually think the victory was his. Because you look at the results of 2009, the urban constituencies that went to Mr. Vajpayee in 2004 came to him. Except that Mrs. Gandhi didn't see it that way. And the Congress party believed the victory was hers. And in the way she behaved and the way the Congress party behaved, he was denied credit where it should have been his. Absolutely. And the party was going on saying that victory was due to Rahul Gandhi. I mean, you know. Well, now, this instance that I quoted where Sonia Gandhi offered the Prime Ministership to Pranab Mukherjee without even consulting the Prime Minister, actually thereafter affected the Prime Minister's relationship with Mr. Mukherjee. You write how Mr. Mukherjee would not show drafts of his budget speech to him. Earlier, you say that when he was Foreign Minister, he would come back from important visits to America where he'd met George Bush or Condoleezza Rice and forget to brief the Prime Minister. I mean, I take it that was a deliberate slight Pranab Mukherjee was indulging in. Yeah, I guess Mr. Mukherjee thought that he was a senior. After all, he was the boss uh, for Dr. Singh when he was a finance minister and Dr. Singh was the governor of the Reserve Bank. And I don't think Mr. Mukherjee made a big secret of it. I mean, uh, he did see, think of himself as senior and di therefore directly answerable to the party president rather than the prime minister. In fact, your book mentions how in UPA 1, and presumably this happened in UPA 2, because ministers were actually selected for cabinet by their party chiefs and not by the prime minister, all of them felt they owed their loyalty to their party chiefs. And the prime minister in herself was someone that they took almost as if he was an equivalent of theirs. They didn't look up to him. But this is, this is true even in earlier coalitions. I mean, don't forget Vajpayee was called a Mukhauta. And uh, Suresh Prabhu had to be sacked because Bal Thakere wanted him sacked. Except that by the end of Vajpayee's six years, Vajpayee had stamped his authority. Absolutely. That Dr. Manmohan Singh never did. Yes, and I give, I give the credit partly to Mr. Vajpayee, but also partly to Brajesh Mishra, his brilliant principal secretary. Had Dr. Manmohan Singh had a Brajesh Mishra equivalent, he might have come closer to stamping his authority. But the absence of a Brajesh Mishra equivalent further weakened Dr. Manmohan Singh. That's precisely my argument. Now, in your book, you say at one point, I was dismayed by the PM's display of spinelessness. Hmm. It brought to my mind that term that Mr. Advani has repeatedly used. Dr. Manmohan Singh is the weakest Prime Minister India has ever had. Well, I don't know if I would call him weakest because I do think that earlier Prime Ministers like Gowda and Gujral also had very limited freedom to act Rule as Prime those Ministers. Out. What about yeah. full-term Prime Ministers? Well, I think he was certainly the weakest full-term Prime Minister. The weakest full-term Prime yeah. Minister? Yeah. A second searingly honest comment in your book is about Dr. Manmohan Singh's personal style and manner 
and how he used it. You say his shy and self-effacing manner was probably his strategy for political survival. You're suggesting that actually he used his shyness, right? What some people even call his subservience as a way of continuing his hold on office. Yes, this used to be said by a lot of people and I, in fact, as media advisor, I had to often argue against this view, particularly in the media and, and, and react to this. But, you know, the more I heard this kind of a view from commentators, the more I began to ask myself whether there was no, not some element of truth in it. And now you believe there's a considerable element yes, of truth. Yes, indeed. Because this is an important part of your epilogue. Yep. What you're suggesting, or at least so I interpret it, is that there must have been times when Dr. Malmohan Singh gave greater priority to continuing in office yeah. rather than standing up for principle yeah. or even standing up for honor. No, I, I don't think he sacrificed principles. I certainly don't think he sacrificed his honor in the sense that the one issue on which he did stand his ground uh, was on foreign policy. I mean, he did say, and I quote him having said, that I'm not going to allow this communist to dictate Indian foreign policy. And, and he stood his ground with the party. So therefore, words like honor and principle, I'm not sure. I don't think he... What about when Rahul Gandhi rubbished that ordinance in public and said it was complete nonsense? That was a direct hit to the Prime Minister, his authority and his image, and the Prime Minister swallowed it. That was in UPA too. I, but I must add, uh, Karan, for your uh, viewers, that the book is largely about UPA. Absolutely. Yeah? So this happened in UPA too.